Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. For those who are dialing from a different time zone, good afternoon and a good evening. I hope everyone is doing well, and it is so exciting that everyone can join us here today. Um, please feel free to say hi um, in the chat box and introduce yourself and let us know where you're dialing in from and which organization or uh, company uh, you represent. So my name is Sally Chiu and I am a research associate at Columbia University. I am truly honored today to welcome you to this event and have the privilege of moderating this distinguished panel on climate actions in fashion policy, business, and innovation. Please allow me to introduce our distinguished panelists. Dr. Anna Callis, who is a member of the New York State Assembly, who recently introduced a fashion act to New York State. And we have Sarah Kent, who is the chief sustainability correspondent at the Business Fashion, and also the brain behind the industry benchmark, the BOF Sustainability Index. And then we have Tiago Valente, who is the Global Creative Director at Journey, and also formerly Director of Partnerships and Culture, Assistant Professor of Fashion Design, and Materiality Pathway Leader at Parsons School of Design. And last, but certainly not least, Nika Mashu, CEO and Co-Founder of Ruby Laboratories, which is spearheading exciting innovation in carbon negative textiles. We are absolutely delighted to have each of you here today. I believe many of you um, in the audience joining the event today has a deep interest in fashion, and I resonate with you as well. Fashion holds significance on so many different levels. It is a medium for self-expression, a representation of social reality, and a reflection of historical changes and the cultural trends. Yet, fashion is also an industry that grapples with immense environmental consequences. We're not just talking about greenhouse gas emissions. We're talking about water pollution. We're also talking about biodiversity loss. These environmental consequences also disproportionately affect various social groups, leading to concerns about social justice and labor rights. Before we start the panel discussion, I would like to provide you with a set of statistics from some existing research and studies. These numbers paint a vivid picture of the extensive environmental footprint left by the fashion industry. According to the UNEP and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, it is estimated that the fashion industry contributes to up to 10% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This is more than all international flight and maritime shipping combined. If we keep business as usual, this number will surge more than 50% by year 2030. Each year, the fashion industry uses 33 billion cubic meters of water, which is enough to meet the consumption need of 5 million people. Fabric dyeing and treatment is responsible for around 20% of wastewater worldwide. Of the total fiber input used for clothing, 87% is incinerated or disposed in the landfill. Each year, a half million tons of plastic microfiber are dumped into the ocean. That is equivalent to 50 billion plastic bottles. These fibers cannot be extracted from water and will spread across the food chain. According to Bloomberg, but fashion product accounts for 20% of the plastic produced globally each year. Each second, around 2,150 pieces of clothing are being thrown away in the United States. The United States also throws away the equivalent of about 70 pairs of pants per person in waste each year. In recent years, there has been an increasing awareness among the fashion industry from brands to suppliers to consumers. Many brands are pledging to use recycled materials, switching to renewable energy and operation, and releasing climate sustainability reports. More consumers are also opting to buy secondhand. But these efforts are far from enough to get fashion industry on the right track to meet the 1.5 Celsius degree target as outlined by the Paris Agreement. They also do not measure up to the vision of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050, as outlined by the UN's Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Actions. 
I hope this information provides a helpful starting point for you to approach this topic. Our panelists will further explore the solutions and challenges from various perspectives today. So we'll kick off the discussion with each of our four panelists providing an introduction from their own ex expertise area. And then we'll move into a more open-ended discussion where they will address your questions. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please submit them via the Q&A box on the screen. Without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Anna Callis, to speak about the Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act. Dr. Callis, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for taking the time this morning to be here. I, um, I'm a teacher first, a politician second. Uh, so this is very near and dear to my heart to spread information and empower all of you um, with the knowledge of what we're doing, what's possible, what uh, what you can do to, to help, um, and what obviously is contributing to the problem. So I'm going to jump right in, um, given the interest of time. Uh, this uh, I'm, I'm going to be speaking this morning about the Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act. We call it the Fashion Act. If you want to read the bill or read more about the bill, you can actually go to the Fashion Act uh, dot, I think it's the Fashion Act dot org. Um, so all these pieces are there and the actual bill is there as well. So next slide. Um, so we touched on this uh, already. Textiles are one of the greatest contribute contributors of climate change. Uh, I would like to just add to this a few things, which is that I do not believe that we can reach our climate goals globally that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has set unless we address the emissions in the textile industry. One, because it's never been regulated globally before, and two, because it's such a great individual contributor to climate change. Um, but the other thing that was mentioned briefly, it's not just carbon emissions, methane emissions, it's also the pollution of water and air. That obviously is the destruction of the uh, ecosystem for many species on the planet. So there are two separate issues here. Please, next slide. So here are some facts. According to the UN, the science is clear. Uh, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change emissions, we need to reduce our total global greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. That's six and a half years from now. I just want everybody to let that sink in because I don't know about you all, but six and a half years seems to go extremely quickly. Um, so we will be at 2030 at the blink of an eye, and we need to reduce our total global greenhouse gas emissions by 50% to avoid the worst of climate impacts. Something I did not put on this slide, but I do think is important for people to know. There's something that scientists have been tracking, and they're called the nine planetary boundaries. When we pass these nine measures, um, thresholds of these nine measures, we will hit runaway climate change. And that is uh, a situation where we can't prevent what is happening and it is exponentially increasing. And that is when we do things like uh, lose all the permafrost um, in the Antarctic, because that holds a phenomenal amount of methane from millions of years ago, and it is melting at hyperspeed. So that's what they mean when they say runaway climate change. And as we said, the textile industry contributes about eight to 10%. Next slide. So the fashion industry and child labor, I wanna focus on two things. One, child labor, uh, slave labor on the labor side and then on the other side environment. Next slide. So this, unfortunately, I, I have a picture here. This is unfortunately way too common. The fashion industry, like um, almost any other industry in the world, uh, has a significant number of children working in the industry. It's actually the second highest rate of child labor globally. Um, and it is also one of the top five industries for slave labor. Um, the, what, what we think of as slave labor, uh, we need to expand. Um, it is in these definitions, uh, a situation where there are no other options. Um, some There are cases where when the people come to the factory in the morning, the doors are locked, the doors are closed in the morning. And uh, in many situations, uh, unfortunately too many situations, people are not paid for their work. And there are reasons for this, and we can discuss this later, 
um, some that uh, happen, I think, honestly, because people in the industry aren't really realizing the impacts of people way down the supply chain, like changing an order dramatically from one minute to the next and saying you still need to meet a three week deadline. Uh, and oh, by the way, we're changing even uh, the, 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 the models that we're using or the patterns that we're using. All the work that was done up to that point will probably not get paid for. Um, so those are the types of things we're talking about, stolen wages, slave labor. Next slide. So there's been a tenfold increase in US clothing waste to landfills from 1960 to 2018. I wanted to give you the context of the contribution that the United States is playing to this. This is a global problem. But per capita, the United States um, is in some measures the second and in some measures the worst culprit of, um, of clothes going to landfills. Next slide. You can see the data here. This is the generation um, and it goes from uh, 1,360 uh, thousand tons going to landfills. Um, this is municipal solid waste. That's what MSW stands for. That was 1960 to over almost 13,000. And you can see the amount going to landfills specifically, 1,300 uh, over 9,000 uh, tons, tons of, uh, of material from the textile industry going to landfill. Next slide. Uh, there was one, yep, so you can see the pattern here, um, about 1.76 million tons of clothing and footwear waste generated, and this is 17 million tons of clothing and footwear waste generated uh, in total. The other thing that I wanted to note, it's not on this slide, but we are the second largest consumer of fast fashion by weight. But because the, the number one is China, but because our population is about a, tw a, a fifth of the size of China, we actually far exceed China per capita in fast fashion consumption in the United States. Next slide. So this is a really important quote that sets the foundation for the Fashion Act. Benefits accrue when multinational enterprises supply the products and services that consumers want to buy at competitive prices and when they provide fair returns to suppliers per capital. The ability of multinational enterprises to promote sustainable development is greatly enhanced when trade and investment are conducted in a context of open, competitive, and appropriately regulated markets. That is the understanding. I appreciate this quote because it talks about a balance. You have the competitive markets, but it is in the context of a market that is regulated. Next slide. So that brings us to the Fashion Act. Please do remember these numbers. If you can't remember both of them, the Assembly Bill is 4333. And you can look that up anytime. Next slide. So laying the foundation of the Fashion Act. Um, the Fashion Act uses something from the OECD that you saw from the last slide called a due diligence as a foundation. And I say this because this is really what I call due diligence uh, 2.0. What people know is sort of the original model of due diligence really led to what is considered by most people um, a transparency bill created a mechanism for the industry to be more transparent about what was going on in the industry because there are so many entities in the middle who are negotiating between brands and suppliers and manufacturers, there is a, a lot of obscurity in the industry. So this created a mechanism to open that lid and show people at least what was going on because data, of course, is the foundation of change. Uh, so due diligence is that first step for this for this model. And the other piece of it that's really important is that instead of being exclusively benchmarks, for example, in, in New York State, we have the climate laws that say that we will reduce our total um, emissions from our electric grid by 70% by 2030. How did we get to that 70%? Well, it's generally considered something that we think is achievable. It's aggressive. It's achievable. But it is, for the most part, arbitrary, right? Um, that it is 2030. Well, really, from the data, it should have been 
1990, if we're really being fully honest with what would have been ideal. We are in the process of severe climate change. That is how fast we feel we can change. But the point of this legislation is to say, no, let's be risk-based about this to some extent, where we identify all the risks, and then we require the industry to shift and reduce those risks over time continuously reducing that risk over time, not simply just reaching a benchmark and then calling it a day. And if we write a bill exclusively like that, now this bill does have some benchmarks, but if it is exclusively that, once those benchmarks are achieved, there is literally no more legal precedent or mechanism to require improvements in the industry. So that is why we based it uh, on a, a risk-based hybrid model. And, and the other things that I will say that are really important, it uses universal direct measures. So p the industry has to measure things directly, but the measurements that we use in this bill are universally recognized and also universally already used in many industries. Um, and of course, the mechanism that we've created prevents greenwashing, and I'll explain how in the next slides. Next, please. So the first step is mapping uh, a seller's supply chain. So this is from the brands all the way through their entire supply chain from tier one all the way to tier four. Next slide. Um, so you see these, two, two, these four tiers. Anyone who's familiar with the industry knows tier one producers finishing goods for fashion sellers all the way down to tier four, which is the providers of the raw materials. So this goes all the way down to the farms. And all of this in, is included in the Fashion Act. Next slide. So tier one, uh, a fashion seller or a brand, and let me step back for a second, the brands who are held responsible to this act are brands that have their headquarters anywhere in the world, but that want to sell in New York. And it's specific to brands that have a global gross income over a hundred million. For those brands, they must meet these requirements in order to sell in New York state. So the first tier, a minimum of 75% of the supply chain within 12 months. Next slide. Tier two is a minimum of 75% of the supply chain within two years after the law goes into effect. And the next slide. Tier three and four are a minimum of 50% by volume or dollar value within three years after the law. You remember a few slides ago, I said um, that the priority needs to be reducing risk. So it can't be that the brand is identifying the best examples throughout the supply chain and only mapping those that they need to find the areas of highest risk, and those are the targets of the mapping. Next slide. Step two is the due diligence that I referred to. Next slide. Due diligence, uh, this is requiring a whole series of measures. So the first phase is mapping. The second is tracking the data throughout that entire map measuring and reporting greenhouse gas emissions um, based on the greenhouse gas protocols. Those are globally recognized and already used in many industries, including the fashion industry. Set and achieve science-based climate targets. Science-based standards are also globally recognized and used. Sample and report wastewater chemical concentrations and water usage, and these are using international measures as well. And track implement uh, implementation and results of all the above efforts. So track implementation is really important by track mean report, and these reports need to be publicly available. And provide for a co uh, cooperate, uh, provide for an, or cooperate in remediation of adverse impacts. So they are responsible throughout their supply chain for being a part of the remediation, taking into consideration that the prices that they offer, how often they change their orders, how often they change their models, that can affect this entire supply chain and how sustainable and socially accountable it is. Next slide. Uh, other pieces of the due diligence I mentioned, brands also have responsibility, meaning they can hold, be held legally accountable for actions that are taken throughout their entire supply chain because they have a direct impact on that supply chain by who they choose to partner with and contract and how much they audit, how thoroughly they audit, how much they act as actual partners. This is not one way. 
how much they pay for contracts will influence whether the workers get paid, for example, how much they get paid, how much is invested in the capital uh, of the building itself to make sure that we don't have another Rana Plaza or other incidences like that where there were 13, over 1,300 people or 1,134 people who died in an instant when that building collapsed uh, in Bangladesh. The act includes detailed language on purchasing practices, as I mentioned, so that they can be uh, responsible in their action. Next slide. So the step three is reporting. This is very straightforward and I'll go through the next three steps very quickly. Reporting being the first, next slide. So the reporting requirements laid out in the law says that within 18 months of the effective date of the law, brands must begin submitting a due diligence report annually, and that report needs to go to the attorney general, and it needs to be uh, um, online so that it is easily accessible and uh, findable um, by the public specifically. Next slide. And these are our the next two are extremely important, and this is what makes due diligence 2.0. Next slide. So for the regulations, these will be promulgated by the Department of State in collaboration with the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, and the Department of Labor. So anybody who has um, ever read through laws before, sometimes it can be kind of confusing because there's almost like these blank spots that say, well, after the law is put into place, so-and-so will figure out how to achieve these regulations, how to achieve these goals. That is specific because once a law is law, that cannot be changed without tremendous amounts of work. But regulations are more flexible. That's done by the executive branch, and they can adjust as we learn new information and make sure that we maintain best practices. So the regulations, meaning um, who can validate the reports by the brands, the data from the brands, specific things like that are determined through regulations. Next slide. The next step is verification. Next slide. This specifically means that the Department of State, again, with the two other agencies, will develop a process for accrediting verification bodies authorized to provide verification. So not only does mapping need to happen, specific direct data need to be calcul uh, calculated and reported, but that data will be uh, assessed by a third party, and that third party needs to be uh, verified and accredited by the state in order to be an entity that's allowed to verify the data from the brands. Next slide. The last being enforcement, and this is the most important piece of this, now that we've set the in entire framework. Next slide. The bill specifically says that the New York Attorney General will annually publish and make available the list of fashion sellers who are uh, known to be out of compliance with everything I've stated so far. They will be given a grace period. When that report comes out, they'll be given three months to comply. Only then, if they do not comply, will the Attorney General be given the authority to fine up to 2% of the brand's annual gross income. Next slide. That fund, those funds that are collected will then go into what we are calling a community benefit fund. Uh, and that fund is, will specifically be targeted um, to, uh, to address uh, some of the issues that led to the brand being out of compliance, either with respect to the environmental issues or labor issues um, in the tier one garment workers. So specifically to make the tier one garment workers whole, if there are any wages stolen, uh, to make sure that there are capital improvements, that the suppliers are made whole, um, and that all the environmental uh, um, issues that were found to be out of compliance, like emissions um, and like water pollution are, are addressed. Um, and the money shall be payable from the fund on the audit and warrant of the comptroller. So again, we're bringing in another entity to make sure that this is being spent in uh, a responsible way. Next slide. So the key takeaways to close up, to make fundamental change towards a truly sustainable system, we must have legislation and oversight. And I say this specifically because we are hearing from brands all the time. If we try to take a step forward and all the rest of the industry doesn't, we are at a profound uh, competitive disadvantage with the rest of the entire industry. And so it makes it much more difficult to move forward and continue to thrive as a business. So 
creating the government, the legislative action and oversight creates an equal playing field. It also creates um, equal and active partners throughout the entire supply chain from the brands all the way through all of their partners down to the farm. That is critically important that everybody has the same goal in mind. Um, so that last, of course, being equal playing field. Next slide. Uh, it's also important to know that the EU this spring officially voted to regulate the fashion industry globally for the first time in history, that any entity has uh, made the decision to regulate the industry. This is an official vote. And since its introdu introduction, a version of the Fashion Act has been introduced in four other states, as well as there is a, uh, a watered down version at the federal level, but I'm focusing right now on the states. The reason I bring all of this up is that we are all in coordination right now. The worst thing that we could do is to have a different law with different regulations in every single state and every single country in the EU. Imagine then the brands have to comply with different regulations all, all over the place, which would make it really, I think, impossible um, to have effective compliance. So it's important that we are all coordinated. So this is truly a global regulation of the industry to create that equal playing field um, and the collective incorporation of everyone um, to reach these goals and these solutions. Next slide. So I end by just saying we need your voice um, for the Fashion Act. Everyone needs to be involved. And we aren't going to achieve this without you all. This is a huge, uh, a huge piece of legislation, global changing piece of legislation. And I cannot stress enough how impactful it is to hear from the public. Every single legislator calling your legislator, calling the governor, saying that this is important, that you want to see this industry regulated because you want to be educated. And the only way you can be educated is if there's transparency and if there's accountability. And this is the mechanism to create transparency and accountability for the industry and for all of ourselves so that we can be part of this climate solution and have any chance of preventing the worst of climate change. And finally, address the fact that there are hundreds of millions of people working in this industry who are negatively affected by the choices that we make as consumers, that we make as brands, and that we make as legislators. So we have to work together. I'm going to pass it on to the next person. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here. So I think I'm jumping in next, and I'm going to. Sally, unless you want to jump into. Oh, uh, no, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Callis for providing the valuable insights from a policy making perspective and for emphasizing the need to create such a comprehensive change throughout the supply chain to have a truly sustainable system. And of course, um, next up, we have Sarah Kent, um, Chief Sustainability Correspondent from BOF, and she'll be talking about some crucial areas that companies and brands must focus on to narrow the sustainability gap. Sarah, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much, Sally. And yeah, I'm going to uh, provide a little more context, I guess, on where the industry sits today um, with a lack of regulation in place. Um, and to do that, I'm going to give you, if you'll indulge me, a little bit of background on myself. I only started covering the fashion industry four years ago in 2019. And before that, I'd spent my entire career covering the energy sector at the Wall Street Journal, writing about OPEC and oil majors, um, fracking and petrochemicals, all the kind of things that you might normally think about when you think about the industries that are most responsible for climate change. Um, but as you've already heard today, um, this sector fashion, which is historically very overlooked by regulators and anyone looking at this much bigger topic, um, has a huge impact. And just to reiterate, we are talking about a, you know, more than $2 trillion industry, which depending on what study you're looking at, um, counts for anything between two and 10% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it is an industry with a supply chain that stretches from cattle branches that are linked to deforestation in the Amazon, to sweatshops in LA, through to microplastics that shed off our clothes and are now ubiquitous in our waterways. And that's just a tiny fraction of how the industry impacts us, the planet and our lives and people with working within it. Um, but here's what I found out when I stopped covering the oil industry and started writing about fashion. 
the number of experts I could turn to to help me unpack all of this incredibly complex series of interconnected problems and very opaque supply chains dwindled. This is an industry that is a really big part of the problem and it's really, really poorly understood, even within the industry itself. There are a handful of amazing experts who probably hear from me far more than they'd like to. Um, but I, when I was covering oil, I had dozens of people I could call up about any specific thing with you know, true deep expertise, multiple different um, analyses of, of the issues at hand who could really help me understand them. So um, covering fashion, a lot more work for me on my part, um, but also a bigger problem for the world in general, because we don't really understand the problems. We can't be as smart as we should be about how to fix them. And this really um, was clarified for me pr pretty early into my time covering the sector um, when two of the world's biggest luxury companies um, engaged in what one might call, were they not such um, genteel institutions, um, a pissing match over who was doing the most when it came to climate action. Um, and it all started because uh, back in 2019, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, asked Caring CEO, and this, this guy, Caring owns Gucci, Balenciaga, Take Veneta, one of the world's biggest luxury companies. Um, but Emmanuel Macron asked the CEO of Caring to get the industry moving on the environment and bring together a coalition that would make various different commitments to change where the industry stood. Um, and the result was a, a coalition now known as the Fashion Pact, which at the time represented some 30 companies, about a third of the industry, um, and, and many who typically didn't come together and play in the same sandbox together, it was sort of a line in the sand for the industry beginning to stand up and think about climate. But Caring's arch rival, uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, well, rather Louis Vuitton owner LVMH, didn't join. And instead, about a month after this coalition was announced, um, LVMH hosted its own event, outlining its own environmental agenda, and it opened with the statement that, as a company, it prefers acts to pacts. Now, I know that might just sound a little bit snippy, but again, in this very rarefied world of luxury, that is the equivalent of shots fired. Um, and I was trying to cover this and understand this big luxury showdown but really what I was struggling to pin down in communicating this was just absolutely fundamental basic information about what either company was actually doing to address their environmental impact. You know, although historically caring has had a reputation as, as a front runner when it comes to environmental action and you know, LVMH often is more criticized um, or suddenly has been in the past for, for lagging caring. Uh, neither company reported the same information, which made comparing the two empirically really difficult. Um, and what they did disclose was buried in really dense financial documents. And when you're on deadline trying to explain what's going on, it's pretty difficult to wade through all of that. So that was a really long winded way of explaining why I spent much of the last year, the next year, working with an amazing team at Business of Fashion um, to build our own benchmark, which Sally mentioned earlier, um, the BOF Sustainability Index, which was intended to measure how big fashion companies were doing when it came to tackling their environmental impact. And to, we looked at a very broad scope of, of topics, um, you know, all of which have already been mentioned from social impact, water, chemicals, waste, emissions, of course, um, transparency, you know, we, we looked at a number of different metrics. Um, and spoiler alert, what we found was that companies were not making the progress one might like to see. Um, typically where companies were doing well was in target setting, you know, pledging to act, making ambitious commitments. There was much less uh, evidence or information um, around what was actually changing and what, or even what companies were planning to do to deliver on their targets. And we did the whole progress uh, process again last year and found that really not much has changed. In fact, what we did was we expanded the pool of companies we looked at. Um, and just by looking at companies which are slightly smaller and got a little bit less scrutiny than the very biggest companies in the world, we found that um, what was being reported dropped off a lot and incremental gains that we were seeing among the front runners were being more than offset by inaction among 
new entrants and laggards. Um, and, and indeed, just looking beyond the relatively small pool of companies that we had assessed, um, what we're seeing as a trajectory for the fashion industry as a whole is a, a sector that is set to continue to grow. Um, it's getting faster. We're buying more uh, than we ever were before. And the, emission, the industry's emissions are currently on track to increase by 45% by 2030, and they need to halve um, to be to remain in line with the Paris goals. Um, so I'm going to call this phase that we're in at the moment the sort of influencer phase of the industry's climate journey. Um, it's been about shiny objects, neat buzzwords, slick appearances um, that don't necessarily reflect the reality of what's happening on the ground. And you know, brands have tried to sell a story to us as consumers that often can't be backed up. Um, and for, you know, for our part as consumers, and I fall into this bucket too, you know, we don't always shop our values. You know, you go into the shop, you see something you like, if, if it's got a little mark on it saying that it's organic cotton or you know waste-free, that might make you feel even better when you buy it. But if you like it, you're probably still gonna buy it. Um, you know. It is not enough just to be told that something is sustainable to make us want to buy it. Um, and you can just you can see this just by looking at the last two weeks, which has been really interesting for me. Um, I'm here in New York for Climate Week, but I was also here last week when it was Fashion Week. Um, and close to half the brands on the calendar at Fashion Week were talking about sustainability. There was a lot of upcycled products on the runway. It was it was it was really cool to see the creative side of the industry engaging with this. But fast forward to this week and the sector's presence on the schedule has faded. There are a handful of events where the fashion industry is getting involved, but it's not really that present. And if this sounds familiar to people who are in the climate space, but don't necessarily look too much at fashion, it's, it's, it's because this isn't a unique situation to this industry. You know, this pattern of companies setting targets but not delivering of countries doing the same, that this is kind of the challenge that the entire um, climate movement is, is dealing with, is, is needing to um, grapple with. And it's kind of why the theme of this week in New York has been sort of accelerating action because we, we do need to accelerate action. You know, we've seen the record breaking at, uh, temperatures and devastating weather extremes over this summer. As, as Dr. Callis was saying, we've already breached six out of nine planetary boundaries and the window in which to act and, and avoid sort of the most catastrophic effects of climate change is rapidly closing. Um, and yet those conversations that I think at times like Climate Week within the summits that are happening right now are happening with um, increasing urgency aren't filtering through to businesses and to the executive um, decision makers as fast as they should. And you know, I think that may be particularly true in fashion, whose role in the climate crisis has been overlooked for so long. And just to illustrate this, I want to share some analysis I did over the summer when temperatures were reaching record highs. And I I was looking at all of the um, earnings reports companies were, were putting out as we heard about new records being breached on a daily basis. And I took a look at um, what executives were saying on their earnings calls. And what I found is that the weather barely got a mention at all. In the middle of July, no one was talking about this on earnings calls. In fact, it came up just once um, on Montclair's investor call. Now Montclair makes big puffy jackets that are designed to be worn in the cold. And an analyst asked, whether heat waves around the world were hurting the company's sales. And it was very interesting because the response was that, on the contrary, um, as weather has, the hotter weather has meant the company has been able to sell more multi layered products that can be adjusted depending on what the weather is like and typically retail at a higher price point. Um, and meanwhile, what we saw was, you know, companies might not have been talking about the weather, but they were flagging that they were making commitments towards sustainability. For instance, you know, Caring noted its position as a sustainability leader. LVMH flagged a new commitment to reduce water use. Um, Adidas uh, mentioned Yeezy 58 times and sustainability twice. But all three of those companies 
have continued to grow their total emissions despite commitments to reduce them. And I'm not calling out these companies to say that they are doing particularly badly at all. Indeed, you know, they're engaging with this topic more than many others. It's just to illustrate where the industry as a whole is. That said, um, there are some things that do give me hope that real change could be on the way. The first is that the consequences of inaction are becoming much more real. Um, so cl climate change comes at both a human and financial cost, and that price tag is really he hefty. Um, until recently, there's not been much analysis on specifically what that might mean for the fashion industry. But last week, uh, Cornell and Schro Schroeder's released a study that examined how reduced productivity caused by high temperatures and intensifying floods is likely to affect this sector if, if nothing is done to adapt supply chains to it. And, and what they found is that by 2030, um, such weather extremes could reduce export earnings in just a handful of the industry's key manufacturing hubs by $65 billion, um, prevent the creation of 1 million new jobs in those locations and significantly dent operating profits of brands that are exposed um, when compared to a scenario in which the industry takes steps to adapt their supply chain. Um, and those were conservative estimates. Uh, secondly, numbers like that are making investors sit up and pay attention. And it's amazing uh, how much more you can see industries do when the people who hold the purse pur strings start asking questions. So brands are facing more pressure to explain and address their exposure to both climate risks, but also labor abuses within the supply chain. Um, and that is definitely making uh, who pays attention on the C-suite shift. And finally, um, well, not finally, uh, two more points. One, regulators are pushing for more action. And so bills like the New York Fashion Act are helping to shift this conversation. In Europe, there's 16 pieces of regulation and discussion that would make brands more accountable for what happens in their supply chain. And so, Companies are really looking at what's coming down the pipe and thinking about how they need to prepare for this. And, and finally, we're seeing innovations maturing as well. So new technologies that could help reduce the environmental impact of manufacturing, enable more tech recycling, they're becoming more accessible, more affordable, and offering a path to real solutions. And so I just want to close by asking where that leaves us. And I think the answer is with a huge opportunity and a mammoth challenge. Um, the fact that more people are showing up and taking this industry seriously, um, both within the sector and without, is incredibly important. It's amazing to see so many people listening today. Um, but there are a few things we still need to see. And one is money. Companies have ambitious climate commitments in place. They need to explain their strategy to deliver on them and how they're going to fund that. Um, any transition plans that need to be responsible. The fashion industry employs tens of millions of people, many in low wage jobs in countries that are among the most climate vulnerable in the world. Um, and they have to be included in any changes in the way the industry operates. Um, and finally, we need to address the elephant in the room. This is an industry that ran, runs on manufactured consumption. And the fastest way to curb its impact is to just buy less. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for highlighting all the areas that the fashion's role in climate change has been overlooked. And I also found this very accurate that you describe is currently an influencer phase of fashion industry sustainability journey. I could not agree more on that. Um, I believe the real changes do lie in the implementation and bridging these gaps, uh, which uh, really demands the collaborative efforts from all stakeholders in the industry. Um, there's so much work ahead of us on this. Um, for those who haven't checked out the Business Fashion Sustainability Index, I strongly encourage you to explore the report's highlight on their website. It is truly a comprehensive and inspiring piece of work. And now let's shift our focus into innovation. Um, our next speaker is Tiago Volante, um, the Global Creative Director at Journey and also former Director of Partnership of Culture, Assistant Professor of Fashion Design and Materiality Pathway Leader at Parsons School of Design. With his interdisciplinary ex expertise spanning from materiality, creative design and social justice, Tiago's presentation will delve into sustainability and human-centered design. Tiago, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Sally. Uh, thank you, everyone. 
so far for their contributions. And thank you everyone for being here today. Um, uh, Sally mentioned presentation. Well, it's it's not really a presentation. It's it's more of a of a conversation that, uh, or I'll try to make it as conversational as possible while sharing um, uh, some thoughts that I've been having throughout my entire career, and most importantly, um, at this specific stage in which we are. Um, as we were talking before, is a crucial moment for us uh, talking about this topic of sustainability and most important actions, because, uh, you know, we, we, we get it's important to talk about sustainability, but that the word just becomes trapping in itself. We, we need to have actions, right? We need to 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 start doing stuff. Um, but before that, um, I would like to ask a question to all the the attendants here. Um, everyone that has that is out there, I see we have 137 people out there, and I would like to ask you, why did you choose to attend this panel today? And and I mean it. I'm, I'm asking you. <laughs> I invite you to please uh, type in your question, your answers in the chat. Uh, I believe Sally were able to see the chat. Um, if someone uh, from the participants. Uh, if that is possible, I, I would love to hear at least a couple uh, of voices, if, if it's in written form. Uh, I don't know if it's um, live possible. Sally, I know that this is kind of like a bit disruptive and probably you weren't expecting this, but hey, that's the beauty of the spontaneity in life. Um, so anyone that would like to um, share, why did you decide to be here? Why did you decide to attend this panel? And listen to all of us. The chat is disabled. Okay. Could someone uh, answer that question? Yeah, Can we let, let me check. Let me check the chat box. There might be um, some setting. Um, let me see. Ah, I just changed the setting. I apologize for it's the little uh, mishap of the chat box. So yeah, please tap in the messages, everyone. Thank you, Sally. Okay, to understand the interplay of private, public, and scientific organizations, this was one of the few events focused on fashion. Um, anyone else here to learn about policies and innovations in the fashion industry? Well, thank you um, for those. Um, and yeah, I love it. I love it. Everyone is um, so. I'm seeing there your answers. Uh, I'm seeing what, what your thoughts are. But there's something that goes beyond. Yes, you, you came to this virtual space to learn more. But I want to go further. Why did you make the decision to attend this panel with this bunch of strangers um, here in this virtual space and not even in a, in a physical space? Um, and I love how people are already uh, jumping in with their answers. But I'm going to dare to say that there is something um, that perhaps has motivated um, all of you to, um, to attend today. And I think um, it's about trust, right? Um, the Climate School Columbia has already a credential um, that it's based on trust. Why? Because it's a very respected institution. It's transparent. And, and again, it's, it, it, there's facts that prove that it's a very respected and, and reliable institution. This institution has invited us today, uh, speakers, to talk. Why? Because they trust us. And why is it that you trust these strangers here, because we have credentials. How have we been building our credentials? Because we've been working on that throughout our entire career. And to talk about something like sustainability and actions like we were talking today, we build our credentials based on transparency, based on observation, based on trust again. So transparency and trust are the key components or, or a foundation, a very strong foundation um, for any successful relationship. Uh, it, trust is, is important between interpersonal relationships, business relationships, um, 
um, in, in context of education, etc. So I want to start, um, as, as Sally had mentioned before, from a very human approach, a human centric approach. Um, I want to talk about uh, talking about trust and talking about transparency, which are key in order to innovate and move forward, which I will talk about in a bit. Um, I want to talk about a huge crisis, a huge period of crisis that we're living through at the moment. And I mean, there are many crises, unfortunately, happening uh, around us in the world. Um, there's a, a tremendous one that it's happening, and it's it, there's a crisis of lack of empathy. And empathy, it's core to talk about solutions, because without empathy, we cannot innovate. And what is the enemy of, um, someone is asking who invited this guy. Well, um, Columbia invited me, uh, luckily. Um, so talking about um, empathy and about <clears throat> this crisis, the ego, the ego is the enemy of innovation. Why? And, and I'm going to unpack this. Because true innovators don't stop when they are try when they are prototyping, when they are designing, when they're creating a product as solution. And I'm saying this because we're talking about solutions. They don't stop in their creative process when they fail, because that is part of their process. They reflect, um, they, they reflect on their people, they reflect, they, they reflect on, on the feedback that is provided from the people. Uh, on their own observation and they, with this reflection, they go back and they reiterate. And for that, you need to have a high level of empathy because you need to empathize with first with yourself, with kindness and compassion enough to then be able to empathize with communities that you're serving and designing for. And this is something very, perhaps very naive that um, we tend to forget. And and it might sound spiritual for some, or however you want to denominate it, but these, these values, these human values are core when we talk about solutions moving forward. We live in a, in a culture of shame and guilt and uh, basically this cancel culture. And what is it that this is provoking? It's provoking this fear, this fear for innovation, this fear for talking, this fear of transparency. Failure is an option, fear is not. And Sally might remember these words because this is something that I always write on the board on the first day of class. And why I'm talking about fear? Because this fear comes again from this, this crisis of lack of empathy and compassion and kindness and healthy competition and therefore individualism. We are living in the culture of me, myself and my mobile phone. And this individualism goes against, if, again, if we want to create solutions, we can have individual actions, but we really need to work collaboratively. We need to work in a universal co-creation process with open source communities and systems of cooperation in favor of equity and equality. But, ugh. Uh, there we go, and, and, and we enter in a, in a very um, uh, delicate uh, field because how is this even possible in a system that is so complex, almost created on such, on such purpose? Meaning that if we want to talk about climate actions and sustainability, then we need to address these from a very holistic approach and perspective. Because to have a conversation about sustainability and, and climate actions, regardless if it's in fashion or any other field, we need to address racial and gender inequalities, socioeconomic, socioeconomic political inequities, and even colonialism. And, and colonialism is a very important part in all these pieces that we're talking here. Because unfortunately, and already my peers have mentioned that landfill waste, landfill waste from the fashion industry is a form of colonialism. The Western countries are deploying 
92 million tons um, of clothing in landfills every year. These Western countries don't even ask or question if the places that they're deploying these, um, these, fab these uh, garments, these uh, used second uh, garments, that most of the times they are in, in, in terrible state that cannot even be worn, what is the effect that this is going to cause in the countries that they're deploying this? And for that, I want to talk about um, the East African community, um, which is composed by Rwanda, um, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda. Uh, in two, 2016, this um, this conglomerate they tried to ban that Western countries would um, uh, deploy their their garments or would just um, throw their their uh, used garments. And the reason why is not just because this is polluting also their environment, their physical environment, but it's also because it's not allowing these countries to grow. Is allowing is not allowing the local uh, communities, local manufacturing to thrive. It stops the country's economic growth, as I said, jobs, domestic markets, and um, and not only that. Again, it's a form of occupying physically and economically a place um, just because. And this is a serious problem. And together with landfill waste, I want to talk also about water waste and water waste is another form of colonialism that it's um, also a result of a lack of empathy and that's why i was talking before about how empathy is so important if we really want to talk about solutions because this is often uh, missed in the equation in order to create one cotton t-shirt we need 2700 liters of water that's for cotton. And uh, for those of you that might see me uh, speaking with this shirt on, this is not a denim shirt. Actually, it's a beautiful tensile uh, jacquard um, that, that emulates what a denim um, uh, would look like. But it's not. It's, it's highly sustainable. It's, it's made by certified uh, sustainable wood pulp, wood pulp, for those who want to know. I'm happy to talk about that later on if you want to. But I want to continue talking about, um, about, about this issue, about colonialism, about uh, the water waste in this case, because um, the problem with water, and this is something that amazes me still, because when I speak to companies, big companies, designers from companies or creators, um, uh, fashion experts, etc., cetera, or, or fashion aficionados, let's put it that way, uh, when I ask them, do you, do you understand why the water problem is such a big issue? And not everyone knows the answer. The problem, the, the big issue about this is because drinkable water, it's running out. We are, it's a reality. It's finite. It's not going to be forever. It's going to end. And in these communities, specifically in countries in which there is exploitation of resources and people and forced labor, there's already very limited access to drinkable water. And guess what? It is that drinkable water that it's being used in the creation and manufacturing of these products. So this is another form of occupation. Not only we are appropriating um, um, this land, we're also appropriating their resources. So yes, it is a form of, of colonialism that needs to be addressed and that needs to be taken into consideration in the in this conversation now um, most recently in august 25th actually very like few weeks ago uganda has banned the import of used clothing into the country precisely to fight against this because they want to boost their um their um, local economy let's not forget that in 2018 Rwanda implemented a ban as well in used uh, garments, but this, suspend, this resulted in uh, the US suspending Rwanda's right to export clothing duty-free. So once again, a lack of empathy um, is causing um, or is avoiding growth and innovation. 
So I know that I'm, I'm very insisting on this word, but it, it is an important word. Unfortunately, we live in a system that is established and so ingrained in codes of societal structures and systems. This system is called capitalism. We live in it. It's a fact. Um, what catches me at my attention is that um, capital equals money. Um, you know, the word is capital is money. Um, the capital is also the city where leaders work at the region's government, uh, depending on the country, but also there's capital punishment, which is death by punishment. So interesting how this one word ingrains all these different fields. And so we might not be able to change certain things of this um, system, but we have options and we have little hacks that we can use here and there. And for instance, we're having this conversation online. And thanks to this, we're able to, to invite other peers and fellows from other parts of the world. And, and we're able to meet in this virtual joint space. Um, however, there's also a carbon emission resulting from this exchange. And we need to acknowledge this. We need to be transparent with this as well. We need to acknowledge that those pink elephants, there's so many actually, I think Sarah was mentioning that word, but it's true, there's so many pink elephants there. So um, we are in this environment, we're having this um, conversation here, but there are ways in which we can offset what we're doing here, the carbon emission um, that we're being responsible for. And this is also something that it's important that we start thinking because usually when I speak to, to people, people feel very overwhelmed because there's all this information and it is incredible um, that there's so many people all over the world um, making, uh, putting an effort on, on making an impact, a positive impact and creating solutions. And, um, but this can be and can feel overwhelming at points because there's so many ways of how we can contribute. My goal with this little, um, um, let's say, uh, thoughts or share is, um, is to ask you to please go to the core. Please go to the most innate um, component. Go to that curiosity, that innate curiosity that drove the cognitive revolution back in when Homo sapiens um, 30,000 to 70,000 years ago started thinking and started imagining and discovering things. That is what propel innovation. Think about that component of trust. Think about compassion. Think about empathy. Because if we are able, go, if we are able to go to the core, to that most naive and innocent human component and start our journey of discovery, curiosity, and expression from a place of empathy, again, kindness and compassion, um, we can achieve waves of colossal change out there in the world from the core of our very internal heart. So those are my 50 cents for today, and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago, for your insights and for highlighting the importance of trust, transparency, and empathy for our communities in finding solutions. You've really highlighted the importance that sustainable transition within the fashion industry is not just about reducing environmental impact, but also ensuring a just transition for the society at large. Next up, we have Mika, the CEO and co-founder of Ruby Laboratories, who will provide us an overview of the carbon negative yarn technology they've developed. This is an exceptionally exciting innovation, especially considering that conventional material production is a significant source for emission within the fashion value chain. Mika, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Sally. And thanks all of our panelists and the whole audience for being here. Um, excited to take some of your questions soon too. I'll just give a quick overview of um, myself, the industry a little bit, like why raw materials are really critical for us to uh, innovate on. And then about Ruby's technology as a case study um, in the space for 
uh, sustainable futures. Um, so I'm Nika, co-founder and CEO of Ruby. My background's in materials engineering, and I started from a pretty young age being really interested in how we can take inspiration from natural systems and apply them to key technologies like manufacturing and energy um, in order to make them more planet positive. Um, and so I started when I was 15, published my first paper in artificial photosynthesis at a national lab here in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and then continued for 10 years across research fields in renewable energy, energy storage, et cetera. Um, and that was really where I felt a spark of how we could apply new technologies to change the way we do things and create the sort of future that I wanted to see um, with humans, you know, interacting with Earth. Um, and that really led me to um, kind of hone in on the carbon problem. Um, and when you look in the history of manufacturing, like over the last several uh, eras of manufacturing, um, you can see that they're all sort of um, named after materials. So the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Steel Age, um, the Silicon Age. And I think there's a very specific reason for that. Materials actually unlock um, capabilities and new opportunities and prosperity for people on the planet. And when we look to the future uh, within apparel and other industries, at Ruby, we believe that the next era of manufacturing needs to be the symbiotic era. And this is an era where manufacturing can actually be symbiotic with the planet. You heard some of the horrific stats on this, uh, this webinar. Um, fashion is responsible uh, for, it's the third most CO2 polluting supply chain on the planet. Uh, fashion is responsible for deforestation of uh, 300 million trees per year. Um, a lot of 80% uh, of the deforestation actually in the Amazon rainforest can largely be tied to cattle ranching, uh, which is mostly tied to like leather. Um, so fashion is not only you know, creating massive CO2 emissions, but also water and land uh, usage that is incredibly unsustainable and creates the um, inequities that Tiago also mentioned. Um, and the challenge here is these impacts, 70% of them for apparel, they're tied to the raw materials used in the industry. And so even despite, you know, throughout the supply chain, there being different levels of energy use and manufacturing, 70% of this massive CO2 impact actually comes from the production of raw materials. And so for us to change the impact in the industry, um, to, you know, remove fashion from being the third most CO2 polluting supply chain and you know, get to this future where maybe, um, you know, we create manufacturing systems that aren't so detrimental to the planet, we need to reinvent manufacturing of raw materials. And that's what Ruby focuses on. Um, and so what uh, we do at Ruby is we've developed a technology that's actually inspired by how trees and plants work. Um, we use the technology where we can capture CO2, uh, so direct carbon emissions, and actually turn it into the same materials that are already used in the industry. Uh, we specifically, our first focus is in um, man-made cellulosic fibers. So like Tiago was mentioning, Tencel, <laughs> uh, Rayon, Lyocell, et cetera. Um, but that's our first focus, but also aiming to expand to cotton and polyester mimicking fibers in the future as well. Um, and this is really important because the only way that we can, or what we believe at Ruby is the only way that we can have the massive transformation in the industry is by reinventing manufacturing systems. And with this new system that we've developed at Ruby and we're aiming to scale, the big impacts are we can achieve carbon negative materials production, water neutral and land neutral materials production. And um, that's you know, what needs to be the case for us to hit these goals and, you know, in our perspective. Um, and so, you know, we're early stage. Um, right now, we've been really focusing on partnerships with industry. Um, so we've announced several large partnerships with major apparel brands to work on developing uh, our products and also with manufacturers to plug into the supply chain to do the carbon capture and conversion. Um, and so we're we're still working on getting there and implementing. And so in that journey, support from 
brands, manufacturers, regulators, investors are really critical to make changes like this possible. Um, and we're aiming to, over the next year, basically uh, drive commercialization of this new technology, be able to introduce this for the first time into apparel brands' um, you know, portfolio of materials and then scale up from there. Um, I have a few visual examples so you guys can see what I mean because I'm sure, and I've heard from many people that, you know, it just sounds like magic and <laughs> um, doesn't, it, it's hard to understand. So um, the first step in our process is we capture CO2 and we turn that CO2 into cellulose. Um, this is what cellulose pulp looks like. It's kind of like a papery material um, when it's dried. And the best way to understand this, like how do we turn CO2 into a physical material is we're mimicking what trees do. Trees breathe in CO2 and then over several uh, steps using enzymes, they turn that CO2 into physical cellulose to build up their trunk and branches and leaves. So we've basically harnessed a very similar set of enzymes and made them work in an industrial chemical reactor system so that we can run the same processes without being dependent on trees, land, water, et cetera. Um, so that's the first step, take CO2 and make a cellulose product. And then the second step is actually being able to turn that cellulose directly into yarn um, through a fiber spinning process. We drop into the same processes already used in industry. Um, so this yarn was used, uh, was produced through uh, industrial spinning partners. Um, and the performance, the quality, uh, it's designed to all be the same as the standard materials that are already used. And that's really key here. Uh, we think for any solution to really get traction in the fashion industry and then other industries in general is they need to be the same quality or better, price parity or cheaper. Uh, and then you know, dramatically sustainable. So we look at things like it's carbon impact and ours is carbon negative, water uh, and land neutral. Um, and so those are a few really key things that our technology focuses on. And we think that solutions in general in the industry really need to um, enable. Um, I know, you know, there's a lot of great questions for the team here. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and we can move on to Q&A, but um, just really appreciate everyone's time and, and happy to answer any uh, questions about our technology, why it's important, or um, your next steps with making this a reality. Thank you so much, Nika, for your uh, demonstration. And I'm really excited about the potential growth of this technology and look forward to seeing more and more application of this carbon negative yarn. Um, thank you for all the panelists. So now we're moving into the open discussion and the Q&A portion of the event. And I think given the time we have left, we probably can ask uh, each panelist a question and then we'll have a fire round, a, a rapid fire round at the end. Um, so, um, yeah, and then, you know, like if uh, anyone have any other unanswered question, feel free to send us emails later on and we're happy to provide uh, further answers. So the first question, we're just going to go with the order of the, um, the presentation earlier. Um, the first question is for uh, Dr. Anna Callis. Um, so we have a question from Andrea. Uh, in the audience and she said thank you so much for speaking about this i was asked to endorse the bill and i have multiple reservations about the bill as it could have negative cascading effects since it's on um it's one state trying to regulate a uh, global supply chain what do you think about the governor vetoing this if it were to pass the bill seems to be filled with wishes but they seem uh, easy to challenge in court could this lead to courts issuing a broad ruling that would inhibit this and other efforts like the ca bill how would the, also how would the due diligence process actually uh, protect workers Dr. So, Callis. yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Tons of questions in here, Andrea. Fabulous questions. There's a whole bunch of things that I want to say to this. First of all, um, it is absolutely critical that this not be um, one state uh, only. Let me step back for a second, that you don't have different states doing different things, as I said earlier. Um, I do disagree that uh, this is wishful thinking to have one state regulate a global industry. Um, that is literally exactly what happened with the California piece of legislation that increased the 
um, the emission standards for cars sold in that state. It's a huge uh, economy. Uh, and uh, they basically said, industry, you can do what you want, but if you want to sell in, in California, you will meet our emission standards. As you recognize, everybody remembers, uh, the federal government at the time, the president tried to uh, oppose that, um, shoot it down uh, as unconstitutional, but it was upheld as constitutional and it, it changed the global industry because the car manufacturers did not want to have two different supply chains, one for California and one for the rest of the world. That is exactly the model that is being used for this piece of legislation. We also have um, constitutional lawyers uh, and constitutional professionals from uh, from um, Columbia University, from Cornell University, from multiple other universities who are uh, who we have been consulting with and working with, trying to tear the bill apart ourselves. Uh, it is very firm as far as its constitutionality. Uh, if it went any further, of course, uh, we would be risking constitutional issues, but we feel very solid as it is. Um, the question about due diligence, um, I've been quite frustrated about this, to be honest with you, because the, the term is being thrown around as, um, as if globally we all know what it means. Um, and that is why I was very clear that this is not uh, what people sort of, oh, due diligence, and they stop listening, throw it out the window as just a transparency bill. That's not what this is. Um, this bill uses that context in the framework of being comprehensive, that this isn't simply um, measuring and reporting, that this is the comprehensive list of responsibilities by the brands in the context of what is identified as due diligence, that is um, the full list of responsibilities, including things like uh, measuring, reporting, um, verification, um, and in, and implementation and also intervention, all of those pieces. That's all you should be thinking when you hear the phrase due diligence. Then it goes further than that to say, these are all the things that should be measured. So specifically in the context of the workers, uh, it is required in tier one, um, you know, we have been, and I'll step back for a second to say, there is a very large coalition. We have been getting input from brands. We have been getting input from manufacturers and suppliers. We've been getting tons of uh, feedback uh, and uh, working on this uh, with labor groups and representatives for the last two and a half years. Everybody has been giving their input on what is realistic, what is achievable, what is necessary to make real change. Um, and part of this, for example, when I talk about direct measures for labor, the mean wages of workers and how this compares with local minimum wages and living wages, the percentage of unionized factories, uh, hours worked weekly by by month and the hours and frequency of overtime by firm and country. Those are direct measures, but they're universally recognized. Uh, someone said it seems crazy, you know, to have so many measures, too complicated. It's actually not. The industry is already using all of these. It's already been validated. It's already been reproduced. It's already being done. It's just not being done universally. It's also my PhD is in nutritional epidemiology. My work was in the nutrition world originally. It is being done in that industry as well. It is being done in uh, the car manufacturing. There are many industries that have done it. That's why we used the measures we did because they're universally recognized and used with tons of experience. So please know that this has been very well thought through. Uh, it has direct measures, and those direct measures are globally recognized and globally used and globally validated already. It is simply about creating the universality of the usage to create that equal playing field. That's what's so important. So again, highly encourage everybody to read the bill if they want. We were very intentional to try to translate it as much into English as possible. So I actually think it's quite a fascinating read, um, but it is elegant. It is an elegant piece of legislation and it's very thorough. So um, the fashionact.org, hopefully I answered all of those questions. If I missed any, um, I will try and put it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Callis. And the next question uh, is for Sarah. And it's it's a very uh, interesting thing to think. How do business balance their revenue growth with their sustainability goals? And I would like to ask, based on your experience, uh, can you offer some insight or give some examples or strategies uh, for business to balance these two areas? Uh, for example, like are there any new technologies emerging and such? 
Yeah, I think that is really the, a critical question and one of the reasons why we have perhaps seen action moving more slowly than commitments, um, because it's not clear yet. I think when the fashion industry talks about its transition plan, increasingly what is talked about is the idea of a circular industry. So the way the industry um, philosophically is thinking about what it could look like in a world where we are more environmentally and socially responsible is, is one where um, the products that are made are then you recycled back into new products at the end of their life. They're ideally used for as long as possible. Brands are perhaps finding ways to um, make money on the resale market. So you make a product once, but you make money from it multiple times. Um, and you know, techno technological enablers for that include you know, the tech platforms that power resale, recycling technologies, new types of material that are easier to recycle or even um, biodegradable, for instance. But it, we're quite far off from a point where those things are a reality in terms of really moving the needle on any brand's individual revenue. Um, and the path to get there requires an investment. And even were we to get to that point, it, it doesn't cover the full entirety of all of the different elements that we're going to have to address um, to make the industry more responsible and make any transition um, fair and equitable. Um, but I, I think sort of the answers to what is a really wicked, messy challenge lie in many different um, businesses and stakeholders coming together in a way that they haven't historically. So for instance, um, you know, Dr. Kellis was saying regulation can be an enabler, it can le level the playing field, it can mean that it is not as risky for a brand or a, any form of company within the value chain to invest in change. It can, you know, penalize those who do not and incentivize those who do. Um, but what we need to do is create a framework where, where companies are able to invest for the long term rather than having to meet um, quarterly targets that may not adequately value um, upfront investment now and in something that will improve the future long term because what all of the scientific analysis concludes is that you know we're probably going to have to pay to make changes now to make our industries right for a planet that is not far too hot for all of us but if we don't invest now it's going to be a lot more expensive later thank you sarah and next up we have a question for tiago um, uh, I want to ask you, what advice would you give to emerging designers uh, who want to incorporate more sustainable and socially conscious principles into their creative process? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to go back to, to that key word, empathy, first. Um, uh, you, you need to, to have this as, as your North Star. Um, and the other thing is that nowadays, I personally don't think that the world needs more names and last names uh, or more ego. I think the world needs more um, thinkers, innovators, and problem solvers. And, um, and for that reason, I think it's important if we talk about fashion, uh, that the innovation is something that comes at the very beginning and the inception of what we are designing or when we are designing or how we are designing, not once we have designed and then how can I innovate this and take it to the next level? Meaning integrate materiality innovation already or think or, or design with materiality innovation in mind. So then you are already adding that component into your final design. And I also want to make a, a, a connection here because for all of us, and, and regardless if we are in fashion or not, for all of us, um, creative expression, personal expression, artistic expression, uh, representation of the self in however way you want to denominate that, it's very important. So some people and some designers, some, some of us uh, want to express ourselves in very unique manners. Now, that uniqueness you can achieve through innovation in your design. If you really create, if you want to create um, a unique a, a unique product, 
um, you have to go back to that curiosity, to that discovery aspect. Again, back in the cognitive revolution, that is what boosted innovation. It was when sapiens were feeling cold in their caves and they wanted to go, to go outside and hunt food or they wanted to um, uh, um, uh, um, harvest. That is what boosted the thinking of, oh, how about I, I play with this fiber, I play with this plant and then I get this fiber and then this will lead me to X, Y, and Z. So um, empathy, curiosity, an integrated materiality and innovation at the very beginning, at the core of your process. Someone was mentioning uh, recently, I was having a conversation um, with someone uh, in this same context, mentioning that the future of fashion design is not in, in the design, it's in the materiality. And um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, thank you, Tiago, for highlighting the importance of materiality. And I think that's a really great segue to the question um, to Nika. I guess there are two questions. Um, they're kind of similar. I'll combine them together. Um, so um, were the brands or textile manufacturers more open to this new fiber? And how are some of the collaborations between, um, you know, like different manufacturers and brands with Ruby Laboratories? Can you talk a little bit about that, Nika? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for the questions. Um, it's actually very cool to see in the industry. And I think maybe after several years of you know, players in the fashion industry being interested in finding solutions, but there not being any solutions and that leading to greenwashing, I think now what we're seeing as an innovator in the space is the interest is coming from both brands and manufacturers globally. Um, and so we get inbound interest, um, from manufacturers across the world. We're already piloting with manufacturers um, across Asia, Middle East, Europe, the US. Um, it's, it's just really cool to see that players throughout the supply chain know that it's critical to adopt solutions and are like spending the time and research and energy finding solutions that will actually um, kind of start changing the industry because it's also important to their business um, for their customers who are fashion brands. Um, and then on the other side, fashion brands themselves are seeing it as a really critical um, piece uh, to implement into their strategy for future competitiveness in their business, but also because you know, consumers are demanding it. Um, so definitely brands that have um, publicly announced sustainability goals, those are ones that are definitely very motivated to try and find solutions. It's not perfect across the board. Um, it's it's a really tough process to you know, scale something up new for the first time with brands and manufacturers. Um, but there is this really strong interest and especially with some partners who really understand the scaling journey or who have done it before with other partners. There's a lot of collaboration and like dual investment in making this work so that the uh, solutions can actually um, be sustainable in the industry. Um, and so the pilots that we've been doing um, have really been focused on validating our material in industrial conditions and with the key factors that brands look for in their materials. And the fibers we're making are actually not new fibers, uh, which was one thing that we found important to focus on. We make the same fibers that are already used in the industry so that we don't have challenges with adoption or getting to know a new material or anything like that. It's really focused on making the same materials, but through a carbon negative water and land neutral process. And so these pilots, um, we've been learning a lot. We've tested in industrial equipment. We've made our first yarn and are working on making, uh, you know, prototype full garments with our brand partners and then implementing in the supply chain. Um, and so everything we can do to test this in every edge case and what the industry actually looks like is really critical for this being successful. Um, and that's what brands and manufacturers have been most helpful uh, in too. So just good to see across the industry people interested and willing to partner early. Um, I think we need much more of that and we need much more investment upfront and trying to scale these solutions and being realistic and um, what it takes to change the industry um, to get materials that are 
um, you know, carbon negative, water and land neutral that we need. Um, and we appreciate the brands and manufacturers who are there with us <laughs> and encourage more of those partners to uh, understand what it takes and, and really join in the, the mission. Thank you, Nika. And, um, and now we're going to have a very quick round, just a very quick answer for one question. Uh, please share uh, one of your um, favorite resources uh, to people who want to learn more about the sustainability transition in um, the, the fashion industry. It could be a movie, it could be a book, a website, just very quickly, one resource each one. Uh, we'll start with, we'll start with Nika and then we go the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorites and a book we give to every new employee at Ruby um, is called The Fabric of Civilization. It's a book um, about the history of textiles, really good perspective and unlocking um, new possibilities. And then I'll also plug Business of Fashion and Sarah's <laughs> work, because that's definitely one of the main things we look to as well. <laughs> and Tiago. Um, well, Nick, I was going to say also the book as well. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, um, I've been teaching at Parsons um, Materiality Innovation and, and uh, Textile Science. Um, so, you know, it's one of the, the biggest and, and storytelling through materiality so is one of the biggest resources. Um, I would also say that um, talking about trust, uh, when I was uh, sharing my thoughts, there is an amazing resource uh, called um, the Trust Barometer by Edelman. Um, is is uh, a report that it's focused on trust, and um, it, it comes up every year, and it gives you amazing insights. Um, the, the sample is is quite amazing. is is worldwide um, except some regions, and it gives you a sample of where is trust being placed if it's on institutions, governments, and um, brands, et cetera, and how that modify and impacts behaviors and how can we act with solutions. So that is an amazing, unusual um, resource that I go to very often uh, that I suggest people to go. Of course, the state of fashion, uh, obviously, every, every year, uh, waiting for it. And um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, you can find a very comprehensive um, archive there. And also the partnerships that they do and the, the, the um, satellite connections and collaborations uh, are super, super interesting. Thank you, Tiago. Now, Sarah, what's your favorite resource? I mean, I don't want to cheat, but I do think that we do a good job of covering this topic. Um, but I would add to that, um, Sophia Lee and Emily Chan, both of whom used to write for Vogue, well, Emily still writes for Vogue, um, but they've been doing a lot on social media to kind of um, create sharp, short um, explainers around fashion's impact, which I think is really helpful um, and a really good way to kind of help people understand this topic within the fashion industry. Um, so I think there's a lot of really cool stuff out there that is a little bit more consumer focused and, and digestible that's helpful for if you're just shopping, um, you know, remake and I saw I'm sorry, I didn't ask this question, but there was a question in the chat about where um, which brands are doing a good job and um, organizations like remake and fashions for good, um, uh, good on you, sorry, do a really good job of kind of collating which brands are out there and what they're doing and could be a really good resource if you want to find um, ways to shop your value. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Kellis. Uh, well, so uh, my first foray into uh, understanding this comprehensively was actually a book called Unraveled, A Life and Death of a Garment by Maxine Bedat, who's actually been very involved in uh, in the creation of this piece of legislation uh, and the coalition, which has been uh, a wonderful experience. And uh, I also think, you know, because reading, um, it offers uh, something for, for some people, we're all different types of learners, visual, auditory, kinesthetic learners. So I, I also like to suggest documentaries as well. Um, there are a handful of documentaries, and there is, um, if you go to earth.org, um, I'm going to put in the chat uh, a link. They have five documentaries that I think are a great place to start. 
Um, so I just put it in the chat for anybody who wants to see that. Um, but those just really quickly listing some of those documentaries. Um, there's seven, um, Fast Fashion, there's River Blue, Made in Bangladesh, uh, The True Cost, um, Udita, uh, The Next Black, Unravel. Those are the seven documentaries. Start there, start like feeling it. I really appreciated uh, a lot of the conversation that we've had today because everybody knows everyone. I'm a scientist. So research shows that understanding something intellectually is not going to make change. It's not going to make global change. Understanding something emotionally and having it connect to you personally and feeling a tremendous ache when you leave the light on or when you buy that extra piece of clothing or you spend 99 cents on a skirt and you know that, that it was slave labor and you feel it in your gut, you're going to change your practices. So seeing it, feeling it, don't run away from it and then be the inspiration for everybody else in your life. Um, but you're not going to get it if it's just intellectual. So um, those are the things that I've that have helped me that have sparked my anger, my frustration, my my inspiration, um, and my hope all at the same time. So that's why I do this work. And um, thanks for joining us on the journey. And hopefully you'll like them too. Thank you, Dr. Callis. And I also want to say thank you to all of the audience who joined us today. And I know we have limited time, so we're not able to answer each and every of your questions, but please don't worry. Uh, you can, if you go onto the event registration page, you will see my email address. So if you have any unanswered questions, feel free to email them to me and I will direct it to the, the correspondent uh, panelist for answers. Uh, I can also type my email address here. Uh, but uh, besides all of those, I, I think this is a really amazing discussion. And I want to thank you all the panelists for sharing your invaluable insight and expertise today here with us. And uh, I hope the discussion has given an overview of the actions have been taken and more importantly, what actions need to be taken for the fashion industry towards a more sustainable and socially responsible future. And I believe this event only marks a start of the journey here um, uh, for here at a climate school. And moving forward, we do envision more events and perhaps workshops and initiatives uh, dedicated to pushing sustainable transformation within the fashion industry. So we encourage you all to stay engaged and continue this crucial conversation also within your own networks and organization. Thank you for being part of this collective efforts and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone.